Okay. Thank you everybody for joining this month's edition of the Mold Pros uh, monthly webinar. Today, I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Neil Nathan. Uh, when I started doing uh, mold um, research, um, he was one of the people that really like was like a kind of like a mentor to me and like really like show me which parts were important and where we should be like kind of like focusing in on. So I'm really excited to have him here joining us today. Um, he has wrote, written, also written some of the like really seminal books on mold treatment. Um, he sent me an early copy of his book, Toxic. Um, um, I would absolutely love it. Um, I would highly, I, when I am talking to a new practitioner dealing with mold and mycotoxins, it's one of the like books I always tell them like, okay, if you really want to get in this field, this is the book that you first need to read. Um, I know that he has a newer book out he, here on Kindle, which is called Mold and Mycotoxins, uh, Current Evaluations and Treatment. Um, I haven't read it yet, but I imagine it's just as great as his other books. Um, he also has a mentoring program for practitioners, if you're um, interested. Um, so again, I'm really excited to have Dr. Nathan here and I'm very excited to hear what he has to say. Take it away, Dr. Nathan. Okay. Thank you, Matt, I appreciate that. Um, uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Neil Nathan, and I'm here to talk to you about mold, <clears throat> strangely. And so what we're going to talk about today is my way of evaluating and treating patients with mold toxicity. Um, this has evolved over many years. Um, some of you may know that I started working with Dr. Shoemaker in 2005, and after working with him and teaching with him for a number of years, our paths diverged somewhat. And so that this approach is one that um, has been put together as a synthesis using, relying on a lot of the work by Dr. Joe Brewer, an infectious disease specialist from Kansas City, who's published quite a bit in this area. And also it has evolved by literally working with three or 4,000 patients. So what I'd like to do today is give you an overview of mold toxicity, the symptoms, how to evaluate it in a patient and how to treat it. And then I wanna at the very end, give you some newer information about how to improve toxicity specific to certain mold toxins. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, I have no financial ties to any laboratory, medication, or supplement or product that I'm going to discuss in this presentation. I also want to um, clarify that the science of the diagnosis and treatment of mold toxicity is really in its infancy. We know a whole lot more than we did 15 years ago but we have a tremendous amount still to learn. So this presentation is my attempt to synthesize the current information and approaches, and it's always a work in progress. Also be aware that for the last 10, 15 years of my medical practice, um, I was basically referred the patients that other physicians were having difficulty with. And it became essentially a referral practice of the most sensitive patients. As I'm sure you all know, with many patients, the longer they expose to mold, if not treated, they become more and more sensitive in every way. And those patients often can't take the supplements, medications, and treatments that would otherwise get them well. So those are the patients that I have specialized in and my basic stance is, if you can treat those patients successfully, then treating other patients is relatively easy. Okay. And this is a rhododendron called Mendocino Gold, which when it's blooming is, is in my front yard. Okay, so today we're gonna to talk about mold toxicity, how it presents, how to clarify the diagnosis step-by-step. Step. I wanna emphasize that People have often said to me, um, I want your protocol. 
Dr. Nathan. And I, I want to emphasize, I don't have a protocol because it doesn't do justice to the unique genetic and biochemical variability of all the patients that we see. Each patient is unique unto themselves and needs to be treated separately based on their response to what you're doing. So a rigid algorithm won't work. Okay, when we talk about mold toxicity, we often focus on mycotoxins for good reason, but mold toxicity includes not only the mycotoxins, but also fungi, ectinomycetes, mycobacteria, VOCs, beta-glucans, hemolysins, mannans, and proteinases. Essentially, uh, what we call mold soup is inflammatory in nature and produces all of the symptoms that are so devastating. <clears throat> and it's really important to distinguish mold allergy from mold infection or colonization and from mold toxicity. They're not the same. There are many physicians who are still unaware of the existence of mold toxicity. And they think that mold infection, which it is, is a severe life-threatening um, condition that requires systemic antifungal treatment. That's true. But what we see at least as often as allergy is toxicity. And that's gonna be the nature of this discussion, okay? Now, also critical to understand, as we began to learn about mold toxic illness, we realized that mold toxicity was a major cause of serious medical illness, but it also triggered mast cell activation, secondary porphyrias, methylation dysfunction, mitochondrial dysfunction, reactivation of viral, bacterial, and parasitic infections, and really important, limbic dysfunction and vagal nerve dysfunction. And all of those things need to be taken into account when you're working with a patient. Because for many, these conditions have also been set up. And what becomes confusing is what to treat in what order in order to help that patient get well. So key to this discussion is that when you're dealing with a patient with a chronic inflammatory illness, look for and treat all of the causes of that condition. If you treat the downstream components, your treatment will not be successful and it will prolong the illness process. Treat each component only when the body is ready to do so. Okay, so what is mold toxicity? It's generally recognized that in genetically susceptible individuals, which we feel is roughly 25% of our population, mold toxicity is the inability to process mold toxin, which leads to a series of biochemical alterations, originally called by Dr. Shoemaker, the biotoxin pathway, but described perhaps to a more profound degree in the model described by Dr. Navio as the cell danger response. The well, question I get all the time, are all molds toxic? No. As I'm speaking to you right now, I'm, I live in Northern California, literally in the redwoods, right outside my window. I'm looking at a forest environment in which there are probably a thousand species of mold within hailing distance of my deck. Uh, however, that's not necessarily a toxic environment. So which molds are toxic? Which are the ones we want to be talking about? We have Stachybotrys, people refer to as black mold, although of course it's not the only black mold. We have Penicillium, Aspergillus, Ketonium, Altenaria, Fusarium, and Wallemia as the major ones that we currently recognize as major threats to our health. Okay. As I said, right outside my window, there's a whole lot of mold. So are all those molds toxic to me? No, I can take a walk in my woods and be delighted by my experience with mother nature. However, when mold species that are toxic grow in water damaged buildings, 
sometimes called sick building syndrome. These mold species grow unopposed without natural opposition of mold species in their niche, and then we get problems. Okay. So again, I wanna emphasize other interactions with other illnesses that we wanna always keep in mind. The symptoms of mold toxicity are remarkably similar to the symptoms of Lyme disease with its co-infection. Now, although one is a toxin and the other is an infection, the underlying physiology is that both conditions produce inflammatory cytokines in very similar patterns, producing very similar symptoms. There are differences, which we'll talk about in a minute. So we also need to be aware that viral infections will often make mold toxicity worse, as will COVID especially, or even the COVID vaccine for many patients. Also know the connection of multiple chemical sensitivities, MCS. The vast majority of people who have chemical sensitivities and electromagnetic sensitivity have it had it triggered by mold exposure. Mold exposure also triggers food allergy and autoimmunity. Virtually every known autoimmune condition can be triggered by mold toxicity. So here's the deal. Mold toxicity makes everything else worse. Let's go over the symptoms. I don't necessarily want to dwell on them because you can read them, but just understand that mold toxicity as a basic inflammatory process can cause havoc in virtually every organ system of the body. So it prominently causes fatigue and weakness, muscle aches, cramping, and unusual pains, often described as ice pick or lightning bolt. Headache, sensitivity to light, causing tearing, blurred vision, chronic congestion of the sinuses, cough, chest pain, shortness of breath, a condition that looks like asthma, but isn't. Abdominal pain, often with secretory diarrhea. Joint pain, tendonitis, morning stiffness. Cognitive imp impairment, very important. Difficulties with recent memory, assimilation of new information, word finding difficulties, handling numbers, confusion, concentration, disorientation, and what people call brain fog. So working with Dr. Dale Bredesen, who some of you may know, has done some pioneering work on curing or effectively treating Alzheimer disease by discovering the inflammatory sources in that patient, Dr. Bredesen has noted that a large percentage of the patients with Alzheimer's have it triggered by mold toxicity and improve greatly when we treat it. Other symptoms, skin sensitivity, mood swings, appetite swings, sweating, temperature dysregulation, numbness and tingling, often non-anatomically, which I'll talk about more in a minute, vertigo, metallic taste in the mouth, excessive thirst, frequent urination, impotence, menorrhagia, nausea, vomiting. And for a moment now, I'm going to really focus on the symptoms that really are pathognomonic for mold toxicity. If you hear anybody describing these symptoms, they really should ring that bell of, ah, could be mold. So first of all, diagnoses that look like mold, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, I'm gonna come out on a paper written by Dr. Joe Brewer back in 2013, where he took um, 112 patients with chronic fatigue syndrome and he measured urine mycotoxin levels. And in 92% of them, it was elevated. It was an astonishing percent and yet it holds up. So it looks like a lot of our patients who are diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome and told there's no help for that or fibromyalgia, not much we can do about it. Look for mold toxicity because that we can treat. Anytime a specialist lays the label of atypical on a patient, consider mold toxicity as another option. That means atypical multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, 
Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. Patients who have been diagnosed with asthma or chronic sinusitis, this may actually be mold toxicity. Okay. In another category, there's a whole group of psychiatric diagnoses, which are actually mold toxicity. And often patients are treated for years with anti-anxiety and antidepressive medication, partly successfully, but never getting to the root of the cause. Anxiety, depression, depersonalization, cognitive impairment, mood swings, and OCD, that could be mold. Okay. Other key symptoms. If patient describes electrical pain or electrical shocks, ice pick pains, paresthesias, which are numbness and tingling in areas that don't fit dermatomes. So a neurologist will often say, you can't have numbness and tingling in the center of your chest or in the center of your back or in your mid portion of your abdomen or in this part of your face because there's no, it doesn't fit nerve distribution. Well, you can because it does fit autonomic nerve distribution. And when patients complain of these unusual paresthesias, think mold. When patients describe an internal vibration or tremor, not visible from the outside, but they sure can feel it internally. That's mold toxicity or Bartonella. And an increased sensitivity to everything. Mold toxicity triggers limbic dysfunction, and that means increased sensitivity to light, sound, touch, food, chemicals, and EMF, amongst others. So when you see that, mold cross your diagnostic threshold. Okay, so a patient presents with some of these symptoms and you're thinking, okay, that's possible. The next thing you wanna do is get a good history. So you wanna discuss with them, have you ever lived in a moldy building? Did you ever lived in a place where you could see it or smell it? And that means ever, because mold toxicity may show up years after exposure for reasons we'll talk about later. Right now, can you see or smell mold in your environment, work, in your car, especially at home? Okay. If the patient has a symptom profile that makes mold possible and a history, confirm that by doing diagnostic tests, which tell us not only what you have, but how to treat it. So although there are multiple ways of looking at mold toxicity, the one that I have found to be the gold standard is urine mycotoxin testing. In urine mycotoxin testing, we know that if right now you are excreting toxin into, your, into the urine that you're having submitted for analysis, that means it's in your body. And very accurate, not 100%, but quite accurate, quite reproducible, and it not only tells us that you have mold toxicity, but it also tells us which mycotoxins, which will allow us to pick the binders that ultimately will help bind that toxin specifically and get better. Now, other types of testing are available. Um, Dr. Shoemaker has popularized visual contrast testing, testing for biochemical markers, which some of you may know as TGF beta-1, C4A, MSH, VEGF, VIP, MMP9, kind of an alphabet soup of acronyms. Um, some people find it valuable to do genetic testing, and some people feel that testing for um, Marcons is of some value, okay? So why do I think that the urine mycotoxin is far more specific? because it is. In other words, the other tests are much less specific for mold toxicity, and I'll go over that in a little bit here, but urine mycotoxin is very specific for mold toxicity. It's that simple. Okay. A positive urine test confirms that diagnosis, and it tells us again which toxins are involved so we can pick the binders that will be clinically helpful. The two main types of testing currently available are ELISA testing through either real-time or Vibrant Health. Actually, 
Uh, this is an older slide. Vibrant Health now uses uh, liquid chromatography and mass spec. And the Great Plains Laboratory, which uses liquid chromatography and mass spec. They're different. They measure different things and they measure it in different ways with different degrees of accuracy. In theory, mass spec is more accurate and reproducible, but more specific as to what's measured. ELISA testing may measure the toxins and their metabolites and is semi-quantitative. So we're getting different pieces of information by using labs that measure this different ways. Okay, so the real-time lab measures these specific toxins, ochratoxin, trichothecene, aflatoxins, gliotoxin, and zearalanone. Great Plains measures zearalanone, aflatoxin, ochratoxin, steric metacystin, reoridin E, varicarin A, and aneotin B, as well as gliotoxin, mycophenolic acid, ketoglobusin, and citronin. Okay, so again, the labs give, give us different information. Now here's the kicker. They don't measure the same thing in the same way, so comparison is not possible. I, I currently have taught hundreds and hundreds of physicians this information. I'm currently mentoring about 150 physicians on how to do this and the finer points of treating patients with mold toxicity. And they always ask, what's the best test? What, what's the most accurate test? They don't measure the same thing in the same way. Comparison is not possible. In clinical practice, I have had excellent benefit and useful information from both. Although cost may be a consideration, the treatment for mold is time consuming and expensive and getting a good handle initially is well worth the effort and cost. We've learned over time, I'm gonna emphasize this point, that patients with mold toxicity have by the toxicity itself, a compromised ability to detoxify. What that means is that you could have a boatload of toxin in their body and they're unable to excrete it very well into their urine. That means that the first test that they do is almost always gonna be a low ball estimate, which I call tip of the iceberg. And as they get better, almost everyone has increasing amounts of, of mycotoxins in their urine, which doesn't mean they're worse. It means they're detoxifying much better. We discovered early on when we started doing this work that we often missed the diagnosis of mold toxicity if we didn't provoke the test by improving the patient's ability to detoxify briefly before they collected their urine. And so what we discovered was challenge testing in the form of glutathione. And what we worked out was if a patient could take 500 milligrams of glutathione twice a day for a week prior to collecting their urine, we got a much more accurate result. Um, that is definitely true for the real-time lab. Dr. Shaw at Great Plains believes that taking glutathione may interfere with his assay. Having done hundreds and hundreds of assays, I don't agree with that. However, that is their recommendation, and that's the recommendation I give to patients. The other method, and I recommend combining these, is to use some form of sweating the day before the urine is collected, be that a sauna, a hot bath, a hot tub, and for some sensitive patients, even a hot shower. So if possible, do this the night before collection. If you're repeating the test, stop all binders for three days prior to collecting the specimen because that it could interfere with the results. Very important, be careful with the provocation process. Provocation can and does mobilize toxin, sometimes faster than the patient can process those toxins and it may make them worse. So at any sign of worsening, stop the provocation process and have the patient collect their urine immediately. So if they go three days and they can take glutathione and on the fourth day they get worse, 
collect the urine right then. Don't continue giving the glutathione or you'll make them worse, sometimes a lot worse. Okay, okay. <clears throat> Any positive test that you get is likely to be significant. The initial testing numbers may not, as I said, reflect the total toxic load. As I also said, and want to emphasize, a follow-up test, once treatment has been begun, is often higher as the detoxification ability improves. Okay. So what I'm also saying here is that urine testing reflects not only the presence of mycotoxins, but also gives us a little bit of a handle on the body's ability to mobilize and release those toxins. So you have to align the numbers of the test with the clinical picture for the numbers to make any sense. So if you get a repeat test, it's often confusing to people about what does that mean? As I've said, um, one of the, uh, um, which I list as two here, improved detoxification is one of the most common reasons, but there are others. If the numbers are going up, it may mean the patient is being re-exposed to mold on a regular basis, and they've got to look harder for where is that source of mold coming from. If you give too much binder, or if you kill mold using antifungals, you can release more toxin than the patient can process and make them worse, and those numbers will go up. Also, we have learned that when patients take antifungal medications, it sometimes stimulates the toxin in the body to make more toxin to fight off that threat. So we've got to put these numbers in context. Okay. And here's simply a paper that um, documents that last comment showing that amphotericin B does indeed do that. Okay, so I've heard the comment from some people that doesn't everyone have mycotoxins in their urine? So how valid can that test be? Um, so um, when uh, uh, Matt Pratt Hyatt was working at Great Plains, uh, we did a study, or, I'm sorry, they did a study, uh, sorry to even take credit for it, an excellent study, um, which used 82 controls and 103 mold patients. And they showed that indeed 51% of controls did have some okra toxin in their body, although the other mycotoxin levels were absolutely trivial. However, very important, that of those patients that had okra toxin, they had only an average of 1.6 nanograms per gram. But mold patients averaged greater than 18. And that was present in 85% of the patients who had known mold toxicity. So with exception for minor levels of urine um, um, okra toxin, any substantial amount of okra toxin and any other toxin you see in that urine clearly reflects mold toxicity and is not found in controls. Okay, so I, I mentioned before that there are some other things that you can do to make the diagnosis of mold toxicity, although in my opinion, they're not as accurate as the urine mycotoxin test. We have, again, the visual context, biochemical markers, several others. So sorry for the slightly burned slide here, but this is a visual contrast test in which the patient looks at black and white lines on a card um, with, this, is, this fits into the patient's chin. This is a measured distance from the eyes. And they basically tell you what they can see across the card as they read across the card up and down. And this can be graphed in terms of what the patient can see. If the patient can see it, you make a check mark. If they can't see it, you put a zero down. Now what you're supposed to see is in these, between these two lines. 
that's a normal range. And what you can see is for this particular patient, they could see well on rows A and B, which is normal. Everyone can do that. The actual test is rows C, D, and E. And you can see that on row C, they can only go up to the fifth bar. On D, they can only go up to the third. They're not in the range. And on E, they can't see it at all. So this is an abnormal test. What does that mean? Well, if you fail a visual contrast by not being able to see it correctly, it could be mold toxicity, could be Lyme disease, or it could be mercury toxicity. Actually, many of my patients have all of three. So it doesn't nail the diagnosis of mold toxicity. Following it is helpful, but if you're treating mold and you're not treating Lyme and mercury, then it's not gonna really tell you when you're done with treatment. What about those other alphabet soup markers? All of them are basically markers of chronic inflammation. They're not specific for mold. So they can be helpful in making the diagnosis. Patients who have this chronic inflammation usually do not have an elevated SED rate or a highly sensitive CRP. So they don't have that kind of inflammation, but they have the kind of inflammation that these markers do find. However, this does not clarify what process is creating this inflammation. So for example, could be mold, could be Lyme, could be a co-infection, could be mycoplasma, could be chlamydia, could be um, any of various viral infections. All of them can cause that to be elevated. So it doesn't tell us which of those are relevant here. And more important, it isn't a good guide to when you're done with treatment. Some of the people who have been taught that you can use your TGF beta 1 and C4A to know when the mold has been removed. Having done thousands of these and also urine testing, I can tell you when the C TGF beta 1 and C4A comes back to the normal range, in most of those patients, they still have mold toxin in them and we're not done. So if you rely on these markers, you're gonna be um, surprised, not in a good way, that your patient is not as recovered as they think they are. Okay, and I've dwelled on that. And that, by the way, is what my front yard looks like sometimes in the morning. Mm. Okay, so um, basic treatment. Okay, we've talked about diagnosis. Um, the basic treatment is three things. Number one, we have to evaluate the patient's home and work environment to be sure that it is not filled with mold or even has significant mold. The patient cannot get well if they remain in a moldy environment. They can get better to varying degrees, but they cannot get well. So yes, you can start treatment before you've remediated, but either remediation or, or moving to a different environment is mandatory. This is so important financially, socially, in every possible way. This is very, very difficult, but it has to be addressed. Second, we need to use the correct binders to treat the mycotoxins that are present. And third, if the patient is colonized, which is many, if not most, colonization means that during their time of exposure, the patient colonized in their sinus and gut areas, growing mold there. That's why if people leave their moldy environment for a couple of weeks, sometimes they're better and sometimes they're not because sometimes they're carrying the mold with them and leaving the moldy environment doesn't cure them. They have to use binders and take antifungal materials. Okay, there's several ways of looking at um, mold environment and many of you are experts in that area. I'll give you my biases. One of the things I like doing as an inexpensive screening test and to help convince patients that they have a problem is to do mold plates. This involves simply taking a Petri dish with a medium that grows mold, letting it sit on the floor of the room, open to air for a couple of hours, 
putting the top of the plate back on and seeing what grows. Half of the species that grow are not toxic, but those, those plates do need to be evaluated so that we know if there is toxic mold growing there and we have a crude estimate of how much. Um, ERMI testing is probably m quite a bit more accurate, but it is more expensive. The beauty of mold plates is not only are they cheaper, but you can test every room of the house, the car, work, garage, crawl space, attic, and especially the rooms that patients spend their time in so that you can begin to focus in on where the mold might be so that a remediator can, can quickly go, okay, these rooms are fairly clean, but this looks like where the problem is. If all of the rooms have a, a significant amount of say penicillium or aspergillus, then there's a good chance that the mold is in the HVAC system spewing mold spores all over the place. So it gives a remediator a, a, a good starting point for what to look for before they do the more specific ERMI testing. I strongly encourage our patients to have an independent environmental evaluation. Um, again, that is critical for healing. Okay. And I sometimes call this my backyard. I actually live about two miles from the ocean. Um, it's about 150 miles north of San Francisco. And my dogs and my wife and I walk there, I don't know, four or five days a week. So not bad. Okay. So now let's talk about the next two stages of treatment, which are binders and antifungal treatment. Um, so we actually know a fair amount about which mycotoxins are bound by which binders. So for example, for ochratoxin, we know that it is best bound by cholestyramine. For patients for whom cholestyramine is too strong, we can use the medication well called, okay? Activated charcoal will work, but it is a much weaker binder than either of the first two. For gliotoxin, bentonite clay and N-acetylcysteine are good binders, along with the good probiotic yeast, Saccharomyces boulardii. Okay, for trichotoxins um, and aflatoxins, bentonite clay, activated charcoal, and chlorella work well. <coughs> Excuse me. For zeralanone and ineatin B, bentonite clay, and saccharomyces, we have no data on what binds ketoglobusin, but the good news is that our usual binders of clay, charcoal, and chlorella work well, and within a short period of time, we can eliminate ketoglobusin from someone's body by using those binders. Mycophenolic acid and citronin respond quickly to charcoal, clay, and chlorella as well. I do have to talk for a moment about binder and binding because that confuses both clinicians and patients a lot because when we use the word binder, it has the connotation of tight binding, like tightly bound. So we think, oh, okay, if the clay binds to the mycotoxin, it's bound and it's going to go through the GI tract and out the other end and it'll be gone. Maybe. See, the binding we're talking about is much looser than that. A good example of that type of binding would be activated charcoal, which is, doesn't even actually bind, although we call it a binder, it adsorbs or adheres to the bound toxin material. One of my patients described it as static cling. That's kind of correct. What that means, so we have toxin lightly bound, not bound, lightly bound, coming through the gastrointestinal tract, and some of that breaks off. So depending 
on the amount of binder using and how well the patient responds to it. If you take too much binder, it's capable of pulling too much toxin into the GI tract. And some of that binder, some of that toxin works loose, gets reabsorbed into the systemic circulation and those patients will get worse. Literally, you can make patients worse if you take too much binder. <clears throat> That's why I use the middle section there, dosing is critical. So I typically choose the binder that will affect the mycotoxin that is in greatest excess and work my way down the report. And absolutely key to doing this clinically is to assess the patient's sensitivity or their constitutional strength to decide on a preliminary starting dose. As I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, um, my patients tend to be very sensitive. So I typically have to start with minuscule doses of binder and then very slowly and carefully work up. If I have a patient, which I occasionally do, who is constitutionally strong, I can start with lots of binder, they can handle it well, and they can move on faster. Ideally, uh, many binders should be taken away from food or other supplements by two hours on either end. And specifically what I mean by that is charcoal, clay, and chlorella are all negatively charged. They do not bind each other and they are much more effective if taken two hours away from food or supplements or medication on either end. For most of my patients, that generally means either three in the evening or at bedtime. Now, Saccharomyces can be taken with food, as can cholestyramine or Welcol. Now, Welcol and cholestyramine are positively charged, so you don't want to be taking them with charcoal, clay, and chlorella, which are negatively charged. So I'm going to give you, and I won't belabor these particular slides, um, you can either take a, um, a shot screen of the slide or we can get you the slides and you can see these in more detail. All of this is laid out in my book, Toxic, which I encourage um, those of you who have not read it to read. I would also mention that if you have clients or patients and their cognitive abilities are challenged and they can't read a whole book, number one, Toxic is on audio. Some people benefit from that. The other, I just this year updated a book I wrote in 2016, which is a 40 page ebook on mold toxicity, what it is and how to treat it. And that is quite readable. And you may find your clients really benefit from getting a fairly short overview. To be more specific, we're gonna jump in here. Mostly this is to give you a feel for how to work with sensitive patients versus constitutionally strong patients. So if someone has okra toxin, I might start them on a 16th of a teaspoon of cholestyramine and then very slowly work up to a whole teaspoon. I rarely go higher. Um, I am aware that Dr. Shoemaker recommends four scoops of cholestyramine four times a day. Um, that would throw virtually every patient I have under the bus. So, those doses don't jibe with my own experience of how people can take it. For people with a strong constitution, one or two teaspoons of cholestyramine is usually plenty adequate to pull the toxin out without engendering the side effects of cholestyramine. And in very high doses, cholestyramine is very constipating and causes a significant amount of heartburn and gastrointestinal upset. So, if a patient can't tolerate cholestyramine, I might try Wellcol, comes as a 650 milligram tablet. For sensitive patients, I might start at a quarter of a tablet once a day, slowly working up. For stronger patients, one or two tablets with food once a day, working up to three times a day. Shifting gears a little bit to activated charcoal, I might start a sensitive patient on a quarter of a teaspoon a quarter of a capsule once a day, then work my way up to a whole capsule or two a day. With those with a stronger constitution, we can start with one capsule and work up to three a day. For convenience, 
because it's taken away from food. I like clay, charcoal, and chlorella to be taken just once a day so patients don't go crazy with the logistics of figuring out how they can do it. If gliotoxin is on the docket, um, I'll typically start with a, a, a quarter of a capsule of Saccharomyces at a lower dose, like three to five billion units per capsule. And for those with stronger constitutions, five or 10 billion unit capsules, one with each meal is the ultimate dose if they can get there. With bentonite clay, I'll use a liquid bentonite clay to start my sensitive patients on at a quarter or an eighth of a teaspoon. My stronger patients, I'll use capsules of clay starting at one and working up to three capsules a day at the same time. Then I'll add N-acetylcysteine, maybe 500 milligrams once a day with patients with stronger sensitivity, one gram twice a day. <clears throat> with trichostasines and aflatoxins, I'll add clay and charcoal as we just outlined, and then add chlorella, particularly the purer glass-grown chlorella with 200 to 300 milligram tablets. Sensitive patients, a quarter of a tablet once a day working up, and those who are not sensitive, one to three tablets daily or even twice daily. Most chlorella packages will say, take 10 to 15 tablets twice a day. That would throw most of my patients under the bus. I urge them not to follow the direction on the package. Okay, so I said before, I wanna emphasize that you gotta be careful with binders because if you use too much too soon, you'll make people worse. And it may take weeks for them to recover from overdoing it. If you go slow, you're gonna be much more successful. Constipation is common and contraindicated. So usually adding vitamin C and magnesium to the point that bowels are moving more normally is adequate for most people and very well tolerated. Okay, uh, this take a break from this barrage of information. Uh, this is meadow foam, one of the spring flowers we have at the botanical gardens up here in the Fort Bragg area. Okay, what about diet and mold? The basic diet is a high protein, low carb diet. Um, if you want more specifics, 20 to 60 grams of carbs a day. Basic issue is most of our patients have colonized with candida and mold growing in their gut and you're gonna feed it if they take um, carbs to any excess, especially sugar and fruit. So currently a kilo, keto or paleo type diet, most of my patients prefer. Although it's been written about for many years that things that contain yeast like cheese, vinegar, and mushrooms uh, are off limits, I have not found them to be so. So again, I think that's too limiting. Uh, there are some folks who, who strongly emphasize a low mold diet, believing that the amount of mold in food matters. Most of us in this field do not think that the trivial amounts of mold in food matters at all. And I rarely see patients benefit from going on the restrictive mold, low mold diet, okay? So it begs the question though, we do know that there's a little bit of mold in certain food. There's some, we know, in dried fruit, aged cheese, mushrooms, coffee, beer, wine, processed meat, tomato products, and many fermented food products. So some people believe that the urine mycotoxin tests are of no value because people's toxin is coming from food. And most of us who work in this field don't think that's correct. Again, this time working with Matt several years ago, um, we did a, a small study, it's a pilot project on eight patients. What we had them do was avoid all potentially moldy foods for 10 days and did a urine mycotoxin test. Then they pigged out on moldy foods for 10 days and we repeated that test. Of the first eight patients that we ran, somewhat to our surprise, the mycotoxin levels of seven patients all went down 
one patient had a slight increase in ochratoxin level, which does not give much credence. A granted, an N of eight is not statistically significant. It is not adequate. It is my profound hope that we will repeat this study on a much larger group of patients to document it. But to my knowledge, there's been no other study like this in which we can show that there doesn't look like there's much connection with what people eat in terms of food and the toxin in their urine, hence the toxin in their body. Okay, so our program is up and running. We're remediating their home. Maybe it's been done already. Patients are on fully up and running on their binder program. Um, does everybody need to take antifungals? No. If a patient has markedly improved in a short period of time and the urine mycotoxin levels are coming down nicely, there's no reason to go to antifungals. We'll just keep doing that treatment. However, if they're not improving on binders alone and their urine mycotoxin tests keep going up and up, then it is likely that they've colonized and we need to add an antifungal treatment program for their gut and sinus areas. And I typically start with the area that they have the most symptoms. I typically start by using a nasal spray of colloidal silver. The brand I like is Argentin 23, followed by a sinus antifungal and biofilm dissolving agent. Okay. And I'll give you some examples of that. And again, I break it down versus sensitive patients versus constitutionally strong patients. Constitutionally strong patients can usually start on an amphotericin B nasal spray, using an atomizer once daily and working up to twice a day. Sensitive patients should start on a much gentler product like Nystatin, okay? For patients with an intermediate sensitivity, I'll use a 1% itraconazole or a 2% ketoconazole spray. I usually use it with a biofilm dissolving spray because we know that mold and candida make a significant amount of uh, um, um, biofilm and we need to dissolve that biofilm to allow our antifungal to adequately get at the mold. So I'll usually use a nasal spray containing EDTA, again with an atomizer. I used to use BEG spray, but I found that the G, which is gentamicin, caused too many side effects and I now just use BE spray, which is much gentler. Okay, I then turn my attention to the gut and I typically start with, again, uh, colloidal silver orally, followed by Nystatin for Candida, and then add Sporinox 100 milligrams. For sensitive patients, I'll, I'll use a half or one Sporinox, which is 100 milligrams every two weeks and then slowly bump that up to weekly, twice a week, or eventually daily. For constitutionally strong patients, I'll give the Sporinox once or twice daily. For some patients, um, Dr. Michael Gray taught me several years ago that a very gentle amphotericin B solution of 0.06% can be taken orally and nasally even for sensitive patients very effectively. And again, to dissolve biofilm, we need to use biofilm dissolving agents. I like MCBFM from um, Beyond Balance, one or two capsules a day, or Interphase Plus from Clair Labs, one or two capsules a day. Okay, and we're already starting to see rhododendrons growing in our area. And this is uh, one of the later rhododendrons, again, from my front yard. Okay, other ancillary treatments, lactobacillus rhamnosus and KCI protect against aflatoxin and increase catalase and glutathione peroxidase. Lactobacillus plantarum can also help remove aflatoxin and uh, beravibacillus Laterosporus protect against aflatoxin exposure. So good probiotics can be very helpful. You gotta be a little bit careful because some probiotics will actually produce more histamine 
And for those people who have mast cell activation, that can make them worse. Be careful. Here's just a couple of papers demonstrating what I just said. What about allergy? So some patients are both mold toxic and allergic. And it's a nasty combination because if it's growing in them, they're actually allergic to something in their body. So ultimately the treatment will cure them when we get the mold out. So the American Academy of Environmental Medicine teaches excellent courses in how to approach the allergy component. And I often patients need to get allergy treatment with mold toxin treatment in order to make progress. And so one of my thoughts here is glutathione is used by many people um, almost like water because it does improve mold toxicity. However, I am the voice of glutathione caution in that my sensitive patients, most of them can't take glutathione because it mobilizes glutathione faster than they can, mold, um, mobilizes mold toxin faster than they can process it and it will make them worse. And it will not work. So be careful with the use of glutathione. Other ancillary products that I find helpful from Beyond Balance, ProMyco, Myco Reagan, and Toxies Bind are helpful. Um, A Fung from Byron White, uh, Biotoxin Binder from Cellcore, and Biocidin Nasal Spray, helpful. One of my favorite treatments for mold toxicity is intravenous phosphatidylcholine, which helps heal membranes and especially very gently and very effectively helps to pull mycotoxin from membrane surfaces. Ozone um, in very specific ways can be helpful. I don't find ozone given um, intravenously oxygenating the blood or ozonating the blood. That can be helpful for energy temporarily. It's not helpful in curing mold toxin. However, Ozone taken for sinus insufflation has been helpful. It looks something like this. Um, you've got a syringe uh, in my right hand. It's filled with ozone. I've cut the end of a butterfly needle off. I'm gonna put the tip inside my nose. I'm gonna inhale. While I squeeze that ozone in, I'm gonna pinch my nose, let it sit for about 20 seconds, and then I'll breathe out through my nose. The same thing can be done through a modified stethoscope arrangement into the ears. Low dose immunotherapy has been helpful for some patients and transfer factors um, from research uh, nutritionals um, is also available to help improving immuno, the immune response, which plays a role here. Now, for really sensitive patients, and this is very important, I focus today specifically on mold treatment, but I mentioned that it's really important that mold toxin triggers significant limbic and vagal nerve dysfunction. And many of my patients can't move forward. They have to start by using limbic retraining and polyvagal nerve treatment strategies to first quiet their systems. Histamine release in the form of mast cell activation, extremely common in my mold patients to the tune of about 70%. And also think about the possibility of mast cell activation, especially if the patient tells you that within minutes of eating anything, they have symptoms of um, abdominal cramping, bloating, um, palpitations, sweating, itching, hives. Those are symptoms of histamine release and mast cell activation has to be treated early on if those patients are gonna make progress. Okay, I'm gonna move past that. Important comment here. Mold toxins affect the pituitary's ability to regulate hormones. So we commonly see adrenal, thyroid, and sex hormone deficiencies 
which need to be measured, evaluated in treatment early on. You can't completely lock in treatment because you're hitting a moving target here. But if you can even get that patient in the right ballpark, they'll start feeling better quickly and it will speed up their recovery. Okay. The last important component of things that I want to talk about is detoxification, which is for many patients, we talked about their compromised detoxification. We have to address helping them to detoxify in order for them to really get healing. So some, abil some of their ability to detoxify relates to genetics. We can measure their SNPs. I've learned quite a bit about that. And we also need to evaluate it and be aware of gallbladder function, liver function, gut, kidney, and lymphatic function in order to optimize detoxification. I particularly like a book by Dr. Joe Pizzorno, which provides very practical, doable diets that allow us to address general detoxification and specifically detoxification of the gut, the liver, and kidneys separately. Super basic here. Um, you want to avoid toxins in food, water, and the environment. Eat organic, be sure you're getting clean air and water. We need to normalize bowel function, particularly avoiding constipation. Sweating, great way to get rid of toxins. Keeping in mind that mold toxicity is only one aspect of toxic load. Toxic load is the total load of toxins in the body. And when we're treating mold toxicity, we're also lowering the toxic load because the materials that we're using are slowly pulling other toxins in the environment. And those toxins are additive. So what we're really doing in the long run is really helping reduce the total toxic load, okay? And I'm gonna quickly go through these. Uh, my favorite supplements to assist with detoxification are Toxies GL, Iteris, and Redolix. And I list here a number of supplements to improve gallbladder function. First, the ability to make bile with acetyl L-carnitine, calcium pyruvate, uh, pantothene, phosphatidylcholine, and ox bile. Then the ability to mobilize bile, which is a whole separate issue, using bitters. A nice product is made by Quicksilver, globe artichoke, milk thistle, and coffee enemas. And in that regard, ozone enemas can be helpful as well. We can test the stool by a variety of tests. Common ones are the CDSA um, or the GI map, in which we're looking at the population of good bacteria, augmenting that when it's low, killing pathogens like toxigenic bacteria, parasites, and of course, mold, finding allergies, eliminating food allergy, adding fiber, and L-glutamine is often used to improve um, what's called leaky gut. However, in sensitive patients, L-glutamine is often converted in the brain to glutamate, which is neuroexcitatory, and it backfires. So that's the material you wanna be careful with. Okay, common slide here with liver detoxification of phase one and phase two. Uh, detoxification of the liver, gentle is Toxies GL, milk thistle and alpha lipoic acid, NAC, artichoke extract, indole three carbonyl, and the homeopathic epohepat, all very helpful to improve liver function, which is critical in mold toxicity. Okay. I also like frequency specific microcurrent plays a variety of roles. It can specifically help remove toxin and improve the organs of elimination. Lymphatic massage is very helpful. Oil pulling, and as I mentioned, rectal ozone. One new piece of information, for some of you might've heard me speak before, a small team of us, including um, Beth O'Hara, Emily Givler, Larry Young, and Deanna Minich, 
we did a deep dive about a year and a half ago into the medical literature to discover more precisely what was known about how each mycotoxin is specifically detoxified. Okay, I almost never put up slides like this and it um, is available um, in my, my new ebook, which is Mold and Mycotoxins, Current Evaluation and Treatment uh, 2022, brand new. It's, it's there now, but I wanna call your attention to how to use this table. So on the left, there is the detoxification pathway, including phase one pathways and phase two pathways. Next, we have the, the, the mycotoxin. Next, we have nutritional treatment, and then we have supplement that help this work better. And I wanna give you an example to show you how to use the table. If you have an elevated okra toxin, which is extremely common, the mechanisms that work to help improve detoxification here include glucuronidation, glutathione conjugation, amino acid conjugation, and microbial hydrolysis. Okay, looking at the table, if you wanted to improve glucuronidation, you could use quercetin, curcumin, resveratrol, CBD, elagic acid or astaxanthin. Nutritional support would include cruciferous vegetables, turmeric, curry, citrus, grape, berries, walnuts, pomegranate, black currants, and salmon. I would go easy on the fruits because we don't want to be feeding the yeast. If we wanted to improve the glutathione conjugation, we can use other supplements such as genistein, at a product called GSH Assist. Here again, some of the same supplements, but also fermented soy can be helpful. To improve amino acid conjugation, we could use glycine, taurine, glutamine, ornithine, and arginine, and various meats, including turkey, pork, chicken, and pumpkin seeds can improve the nutritional support. So you can see that we can begin to focus on specifics, knowing the toxins that are involved. This new information allows us to help our patients improve their ability to detoxify considerably. And I'm gonna shoot through these because it's just more of the same. Okay, when it comes to doing this type of treatment, please don't cut corners or use shortcuts. For treatment to be optimal, you need to bind all of the toxins present and you have to treat the fungal and candida res reserves or reservoirs for long enough to get negative urine testing. I do a ton of cons consultation and I see so many patients who took a few of the binders, some, and have not gotten better. You have to really go at it. One of my favorite quotes, um, which someone gave me a plaque to immortalize this, if some is good, more is not necessarily better. Okay, rookie mistakes. Jumping in with antifungals before the binders are on board. If you start killing candida or mold, the way antifungals work is that they punch holes in the cell wall, killing that organism but at the same time releasing its contents, which include mycotoxins. So if you're gonna be flooding the body with mycotoxins by killing mold and candida, you need those binders up on board to mop it up as it's being released. So please always get binders on board first. Second mistake, people don't realize how sensitive their patients are and start with too high doses of binders. A third, very important one, starting binders before the patient is ready, meaning some of those sensitive patients will need to treat mast cell activation syndrome, limbic and vagal dysfunction first. Okay, so our knowledge of mold toxicity and treatment still in its infancy, but let's put it this way. We know a whole lot more now than we knew 10 years ago. We're way better at it than we were. However, to every audience, I ask, 
If you discover a new piece of information or something that works, please email me and let me know. I'm always looking for how to do this better. So again, I encourage all of you to read my book, Toxic. Um, I am available for consultations with patients. Um, my new ebook, Mold and Mycotoxins, uh, Current Evaluation and Treatment 2022 is out. And, and for those who are healthcare providers, I do have a mentorship program that I'm doing with Jill Cresta. We meet every two months and we uh, go over case studies, give off the cuff lectures and really help people to get comfortable in this complicated world. So thank you very much for your attention and I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm always expecting to hear applause after you get done, Neil, because I mean, it, internally I'm applauding. Okay, uh, thank, you. thank you, Matt. Do you have a couple of minutes for a couple of questions? Fire away. Uh, well, okay, so just one, um, one is more of a comment than a question. Um, so you like talked about Joe Pizzerno's book on diet. Um, which I think is a great book. I think that also like say, and I'm sure you agree that Jill Krista's book also like gives some good insight into different diets for detoxifications as well. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, um, I, I work closely with Jill Krista. She's fabulous. And her book provides the naturopathic approach to this, which is not contradictory and complementary. complementary. Um, teaching with Jill, we're both often astounded at how closely we agree about what needs to be done. And our training is different, so we approach it somewhat differently. And I found that by combining those approaches um, in whatever way people want, is a great way to go about this. Um, yeah. Jill's, book, Jill's book, by the way, is called Break the Mold. And I, yeah. hi, I highly recommend it. Good. As, as do I, as do I. Um, I do have, uh, we have one question so far. If anybody else has any others, feel free to send them in and I will read them off. Okay, so this is from a, a practitioner. Um, how would you approach a super sensitive patient who is unable to tolerate all supplements and oral treatments? Even trace amounts of gentle binders or low dose um, cursidin were only tolerated for a week or two, and then they had to stop for several weeks to stabilize. Right. Would the first focus be on neural retraining or using other means such as Epsom salt or um, paleoid bath and healthy nutrition? Okay. When someone is that sensitive, and that is a bulk of my practice, so I have a lot of experience with it. What they're basically saying is, um, I don't feel safe in my own body. And, and my limbic system and my vagal nerve, um, it's beyond the scope of the talk, but both of those systems are different parts of the brain that work together to monitor the body for safety. And they have become, through the mold toxicity and through life experience, hypervigilant. So you have a nervous system, this is not psychological, you have a nervous system that's hypervigilant and hyperreactive. Both systems have to quiet down for them to go anywhere. Otherwise, literally, that nervous system reads a little bit of binder as that's not safe and I'm not gonna let you do it. And so those folks invariably need several months of limbic retraining and vagal nerve retraining in, other, in order to begin to be able to take what's gonna get them well. And most of them, the next step is mast cell activation, because almost all of them, their mast cells are activated also. So you would start with very, very low doses for treating mast cell activation, meaning something like neuroprotec, which is a very tiny dose of quercetin once a day, then slowly working that up. How they react to all of these different supplements will tell you the speed at which they can do it. The majority of my sensitive patients within six to eight weeks of doing vagal and um, limbic retraining will not only feel better, but will already be able to begin to start minuscule doses of binders and mast cell activation materials. Some of my most sensitive patients have to work on this for three months, six months, sometimes longer before their body will allow them to move forward. And um, I have a, a whole chapter on 
mast cell activation and on uh, rebooting the nervous system in the book Toxic. If you want to know more about it, I would encourage you to look at that. That's a great answer. And I get that question a lot. And it's always good to um, hear it again, um, just in case the, your answer has changed over the last couple of years. Uh, no, in, in fact, it's it's more than that now. It's it's exclamation point underline. These folks need their limbic and vagal systems worked on. One of the new things I have learned in the last couple of weeks is that many of these people have thiamine deficiency. It looks like mold toxin particularly interferes with the body's ability to metabolize thiamine. And thiamine is critical component of virtually every part of the Krebs cycle, how we make energy in our body. And so one of the things I've recently learned is that some of these people may be helped by taking thiamine starting in low doses and then uh, slowly building that up. Yeah, actually, I think I've read somewhere that uh, some of the mycotoxins inhibit thiamine um, absorption. So correct. Um, I think that probably, I mean, with any like chemist, um, absorption is increased by dosage. And I mean, luckily that thiamine is not one of those supplements that um, you can't really, I mean, overdose it too much because you're just going to urinate out any extra that you have. So yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's exactly correct. It's B1. It's a water-soluble vitamin. There is no known toxicity. And here comes the but. But if someone is thiamine deficient, sometimes, not even mostly, it's a shock to their system to oh. get the first couple of doses yeah. of thiamine. So you want to start with a low dose, 100 milligrams once a day. And after a week, you could easily bump that up to 100 milligrams twice a day. And then uh, many people need up to 600 milligrams a day in order to, over several months, overcome that deficiency. So uh, that's a yeah. that, that, that's a new piece of information to help with that sensitization process. I I'll um, co completely agree with that. I think that what people need to like understand is uh, I guess um, with a lot of these like pathways, they are kind of gummed up by either genetics or. Um, toxicity is that once you start adding in things to like get rid of that gum, that gum, you don't want it to like come through like rushing on like a steam train. You kind of like want to like get rid of it slowly. So I completely agree with you. Like even with like like B five, B twelve, any like supplement, you want to like start slowly and build up because you don't want uh, all these like precursors coming through rapidly. Right. And that's particularly true for your question on the sensitive patient. Yeah. They are very exquisitely sensitive to those things. And I want to emphasize, this is not psychological. It's neurological, and it takes neurological rebooting to fix it. Um, often, people will see how sensitive these folks are and going, oh, that's got to be in your head. And that is doing these patients a grave disservice, because not true. Yeah, uh, and uh, and dealing with um, do you have dealt with these type of people, these individuals on both the clinical side as well as dealing with them and now on the environmental side? Yeah, I mean, I just hear the same story over and over again where these patients have like felt bad for like four, five, six years, and they've been told that this is these symptoms are all in their head, which is right. not not good for them or or their family. Um, right. Other like question I have. So you in the earlier in your talk, you kind of talked about um, the colonization, which uh, um, Joe Brewer kind of like really brought brought to the forefront. What is your thoughts? And have you like seen any data on this of like the percentage of colonization that occurs in the sinus, like in the respiratory science? slash sinuses versus like the gut. Do you know what, do you have like a feel for it? Do you have any data? I, I have no data. I know that Joe doesn't have any data. We just uh, talked recently about that. Um, I, I think as a clinician, what we get into is when you're treating someone, 
if they're not responding to what you're doing and you're doing everything that you know of, that means that there's more going on than you realize. So um, if you haven't treated the gut or the sinuses, that becomes the next step. The, yeah. most, co the most common reason that people aren't getting better when you're doing the right things is that there's still mold in their environment and they haven't found it yet. And, and often that takes a while. With the best remediators in the world, every once in a while, if you don't mind the pun, something falls through the cracks. And, <laughs> yeah. and someone, uh, you know, a, a tile breaks loose in the bathroom and my God, there's mold underneath it or the, the kitchen splashboard, something happens and you go underneath it or something comes up and you find it. So it's even re remediation science, we're still learning all the time about how to, how to do that. that. Yeah. Uh, let me interject a little bit of piece of that I've discovered in the last couple of years. Uh, I've seen a lot of people run ERMIs and get, and get what I call a false negative. Um, that's the reason why I really suggest people do an environmental mycotoxin test because the mycotoxin, I see it like a third of the time I see results where we get a negative on the ERMI, but the mycotoxins are extremely elevated, which indicates to us that we really need to like start like searching for the mycotoxins, which might be trapped behind some type of structure, like a wall or mm -hmm. like in an attic or a basement where the spores can't get into the living space, but the mycotoxins, which are like a thousand times smaller, can get into those living spaces. Um, I completely agree. Um, and the ERMI test might be one of the best tests we have, but is by no means perfect. So that um, you'll get people with a normal ERMI and they'll tell you, I can't go back into that building or I'm gonna be sick within minutes. Their, their body is a better um, test than anything that we know of. And that's unfortunate, but some of these people are literally the canaries in the coal mine and, and their sensitivity is um, amazing. Yeah. Uh, another question here from our doctor. Um, are the treatment steps cumulative? Like, do you continue the binders, the arg argumentin, the antifungals all together? Or I guess, like, do you like discontinue one after you start the other one? Um, so, yes, yes, and yes. They are cumulative. So, if I started with limbic and vagal training, that continues without throughout the entire treatment. Mast cell activation continues throughout the whole treatment because until you get rid of the mold completely, those things are gonna to continue to be stimulated. Then we get into the binders. You're gonna to wanna to take binders throughout treatment. You're gonna to wanna to take antifungals throughout treatment. So yes, it's cumulative. Um, that's the most effective way that Dr. Brewer and I have found to go after this. Um, I really appreciate your time, Neil. Let's just do one more question and I'm gonna let you go, okay? Sure. Um, this one is about diets. This comes from a dietitian, and I think it's very, I mean, a very good question. Um, we talked about keto diets or low carb diets. Um, after successful treatment, can they start to liberalize, liberalize their diet more, like adding more carbs? Because um, some patients, uh, it's extremely tough to like help or keep them to be on a keto diet long term. Um, so the answer is absolutely yes. Once the mold is gone and people recover their health, they no longer have to do any of the things that they're doing at this point. In other words, they don't need to do their limbic retraining. They don't need their mast cell materials. The mast cell activation will be gone. The limbic dysfunction will be gone. The, um, they'll be able to eat more normally. Um, they can be healed, basically. So yes, you can have a normal life after mold treatment. And, I don't know, I've treated three or 4,000 people successfully and, and they're no longer on these regimens. However, it does take a year or two, sometimes more, to get the mold out of the body. So it's very important for people to know from the beginning that I've got to stick with it. And 
uh, relapsing is common. Um, as, a, as a clinician, one of the main things that I do is give patients pep talks because it's hard to sustain their enthusiasm for taking all of this stuff and following this diet. Um, the good news is when you're done, you're done. I wonder, so one thing, one thing similar to that is like I've run like thousands of mold tests and thousands of um, food sensitivity tests. And one thing I have seen is like, um, is that, um, and you've probably seen as well, is that mold can like lead to um, people forming sensitivities to different foods. But I have seen those disappear after the toxins have, uh, um, have left the body. A, a lot of those um, food sensitivities disappear over time after toxins have been removed. Yeah. So that's yeah. insane. Um, and, and, I, and I have seen that as well. Um, I, I don't ever promise anyone that that's gonna get better, uh, but um, clinically we do see that, that as they get better, they can often eat a lot more foods than they could before. Um, a comment, uh, for people who are reacting to gluten, which is extremely common, that particular one often doesn't get better when you when you get to the other side. But the other things, because a lot of our patients, as you're alluding to, Matt, are, um, they might be eating 10 foods by the time they get to me. And um, often, fairly early on, they discover, oh, I can eat a lot more stuff. So one of the things that comes early in treatment is the realization that they can expand their palate and that, yeah. that they love that. Great. Um, Anybody that came in late, I know we had a couple of people come in late. Uh, we are recording this and it'll be on our website by the end of the week. I really appreciate everybody being on. Again, I want to thank Dr. Nathan. Um, as he said here, he's got his like toxic. I mean, that, that book is amazing. It's got so many good graphs and tables. And I think that it is, it's one of those few books that um, covers the novice and the expert all together. Uh, I, I had a very like difficult bridge to, to cross there. Um, and I think that he does a really good job of it. Then he's got his other ebook out, Mold and Microtoxins. Uh, you can find that on um, multiple different um, sources. Um, so thanks everybody. And um, if you need anything, uh, you can contact me through themoldpros.com. And I will talk to you later. Thank you.